as long as how's it going everybody and we're live i think uh that's what i'm checking right now because we changed time zones and i had this problem on my other channel the other day where everything got goofed up because the time changed and uh, yeah but I believe that we are live, so. Cool. Yeah, awesome. Well, I haven't, I haven't seen a picture yet, but I'm pretty sure. My name is Leslie. And I'm Dylan. And this it's, is Music and Mascara, if you haven't been here before. Yeah. Live Sunday night show, 9.30 p.m. Eastern, Eastern time. time. No matter what the computer says, that's what we're doing. And uh, yeah, so I will tell you, we are in a spot this week where the internet is are a little bit slow and we're working the best we can so if you see us drop out a little bit or it's a little jittery or something um that's just how life is right now and i just want to make sure go ahead and say something in the comments y'all if you see uh that we are live because for some reason you can't find us. Well, everything's... Oh, yeah, we are. Okay, cool. So there we are. All right. So now we know we're here. So now so. we know we're here. I guess you already did. Glad Sorry about here. the little rough start there. Um, so a couple things we want to do this week is we're going to go through, obviously, some Q&As on the channel. And then uh, I don't know if you saw the thumbnail or not, but um, we're going to talk to this week about kind of our main subject. It's going to be about the size of the coach that we have and if you are looking for a motorhome a lot of people are really intimidated by big ones there are gives and takes to sure. size and so we're going to talk about um are we too big is it a huge deal that we are huge um actually we're not the biggest there are motorhomes that are a lot bigger than us and kind of gives and takes with that because we have been all over the map with literally yeah with deciding um what size of motorhome to get and so um we're going to talk about that but i guess we'll go through some of these q and a's some i know some people wrote some books and stuff and maybe we'll um do synopses of those yeah maybe yeah um so the first one i want to acknowledge is um Bryant left. He did. He left a lengthy comment. I am a skimmer, and I think I was in the car when I saw it the first time, and I probably skimmed too fast to get to the meat of what he was sharing, and I was like, this comment doesn't make sense. It was like rolling into thought, like it was, I don't know, like just a thought stream or something and right. I was like what is happening so I went back and I read the first part of his comment where he said I missed your live so I'm going to comment as I watch so that was really cool like once I realized what you were doing Bryant um, I really appreciated that and that you took the time to still interact and give your opinion on each piece of the content as we went through it um, once I understood what you were doing which you said right in the beginning. I just didn't read it. Um, we read it together and talked about some of the things you said. Um, so we talked about time change, um, talked about beer and ice cream, and he's missing us live because he's watching The Walking Dead. Um, Fair enough. And apparently he likes to use a drone too. Um, but I did think it was funny. I'm just going to make this point again that Bob Wire is a thing. Bob Wire. A lot of people say Bob, way more people say Bob Wire and I don't feel so bad about it now. Um, awesome. anyway, Brian, so thanks for watching. Thanks for the interaction. Really appreciated it. Um, if you are not aware, I'm just going to share this link as I talk about this. If you're not aware, um, we have some videos that are for our Patreons. Patrons on Patreon. I don't know why I always say that. 
what is a Patreon? Anyway, for our patrons that are on Patreon, um, and keep going. They, I'm just like so intrigued with what you're doing though. Um, <laughs> okay, they um, get some uncut videos, real time, where we're at, what we're doing, and. Um, so just shout out to Gary interacting on our video from last week, but it was just really funny. If you follow, a lot of you follow both of our channels and so it was, we went, he, he was seeing some behind the scenes footage of, um, a museum that we went to mm -hmm. with the Wonder Bread car mm -hmm. and <laughs> it was just funny. It turned into a Texas toast joke. So if you follow Dylan Talks Tone. And, you know, about his relationship with Texas Toast. It was just a really cute interaction. And, and just, it's neat to see, like, the full circle when, you know, everybody's in the same community and it all crosses over. And, I mean, you really feel connected to those people that, like, really get the full picture of what we do and who we interact with. And I just really appreciate that. So, shout out to Gary for um, making those comments and sharing those thoughts. And it it was exactly what we thought too. It's kind of funny why it got shared. Um, so there you go. And then, um, he also said he loved the photos and reminded him of the Ozarks in Arkansas, oh, which yeah. we saw for the first time on this trip over the summer. Um, we were just passing through on those bridges for miles and miles and miles in the motor home. So you could see over the sides had no idea it was so beautiful there. So we definitely want to get back there. Um, and but, stop. We actually just yeah. traveled through there. We didn't actually stop. Which was funny. Like Lake of the Ozarks was all in the news, right? They were one of those first places after everybody was supposed to be in quarantine that had like a big breach. There's a show called Ozark, so people know about it. Mm -hmm. But I didn't even know there was like this whole area in Arkansas until we're driving through it and realize it is the Ozarks. And it is beautiful so agreed doug santanel is watching actually hey doug yeah very cool what else we got um nick made a comment about he doesn't know where the story comes from that they drink warm beer but in the uk they mostly drink lager which is always served very cold but bitter ale is usually at well under ambient temperature. It can be a slightly different story with stout, which can be stored at room temperature, but that kind of thing tends to fall in the same category as craft beers, which are only consumed by people who wear well-groomed beards, man buns, and open-toed sandals with socks. Oh my God. That's so funny because... uh we'll have to call this a man bun then because I like craft beer. Because they're pretty much the same here. <laughs> Uh, definitely pretty much the same here. So, well, thanks for the clarification on the warm beer conversation. Yeah. Because I didn't know, I mean, I don't know. I'm not, I've, I've never been over there. So, I've, I've always been curious about it, though. So, that's cool. Thanks for, uh. Yeah. But apparently, thanks, wherever the myth came from, we heard it. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying yeah. the uh, old beer thing. That's how we learn. We all learn together. That's so right. We all learn and We got to learn from other people's travels and places we haven't been yet. Yep. Because we're going to go, but we haven't been there yet. Um, and I think that's it for... Um, we had one question about taking... So we've talked about this before. We had some Toyota videos up before. Mm -hmm. And somebody was asking about taking the emblem off. And I think they must be mistaken. The new Tundras don't come. It's built into the tailgate. It's just like a shape right form it's stamped into and so it. um that video is actually adding something to kind of fill that space and make it stand out more there's nothing to remove unless you just like replaced your tailgate or something right so however i will tell you that if you um want to take an emblem off a car mm -hmm. having managed a collision shop in my former life, um, we used to do it all the time. And dental floss works pretty good. You have to double it up. If you just use dental floss, 
like one pass of dental floss, you'll probably break it. But if you like uh, take a couple passes of dental floss and twist it, then it'll be strong enough and just go like this underneath the emblem and it'll come off hmm. without doing any damage to the paint because there's usually wax on dental floss and yeah. it will not hurt anything. So there you go. That's what I would suggest to get an we emblem removed off. removed emblems off the motorhome like that. We did because, yep, that's right. We sure did. Um, all right. We got 10 people watching tonight. So Yeah. Far. So let's talk yeah. about the size thing. Okay. What's going on, everybody? I'm oh, John wait. Brooks. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. After workshop video. Okay. So uh, let's talk about size situation. So this came up in actually a Facebook group that I was in, that I am in. And we started talking about it and I was like, no, let's really break this down because there's a lot more to it. Um, we are 38 feet long, 30, uh, 37 inches, I'm, I can't even speak, 37 foot, 11 inches long. So we're 38 feet long. That's just the coach. Then we tow a Jeep Wrangler Rubicon Unlimited. So that's the four door Jeep. And total length were like 58 six so i say 59 feet i say 60 when i book stuff yeah when you book <laughs> stuff and we'll talk about that in a minute um so we're 60 feet long basically for lack of for nearest makes no difference we're 60 feet and like yeah. she said to, to keep it safe is that too long is it a pain um should you be afraid of that sort of length? What do you give and take when we are talking about choosing a length of a motorhome? So for those of you that are new to this and are maybe familiar or not, um, motorized motor coaches start at about 21 feet mm -hmm. with a class B motorhome. So a class B motorhome would be like uh, your Dodge Ram Promaster van sort of like a, an Amazon van, basically. Um, so those start at 21 feet, and then they also have 24 foot ones. They also, the, um, uh, what is it? The Mercedes chassis, Sprinter chassis, can be 24 feet also. And then once you start putting a box on the back of it, the smallest class C, so that's called a class C, where you have the van front and the box on the back, so basically sort of like a U-Haul truck, but it's a motorhome. Um, those start at about 24 feet and go 32. I think they can go bigger now, but yeah. Well, you get a Super C with a big front end on it or like a big Ford front end or a Dodge front end, like a, like a Isada 5 or something. And those will get up to 31 to 36 or so. But the normal, like with the van on the front, with a Ford van on the front, those will get up to about 31 feet. And then 32. And then you get a class A. Class A's can go anywhere from 24, 25. And that's typically the flat front. Yep. So that's the flat front. Looks sort of like a bus, but it's not really a bus like what we have. Can start at about 24, 25 feet and go all the way like an axis like the small van style ones. So those can go from 24, 25 feet all the way to 45. Like a big bus chassis, like a Prevo bus chassis, class A with a tag axle where there's two axles. You don't get four wheels in the back instead of two. Uh, they'll go all the way up to about 45 feet. There can be some bigger ones than that, but that you'll see 44, 45. So we're 38. Um, so let's talk about what you get and what you don't get in stuff that's small. Okay. So let's talk about the pros of a small. Okay. Small pros of small. Yeah. yeah. Pros of so small. Pros of a small because we, we tried to weigh all of these options. Pros of small. I mean, we looked at small as bees, like mm -hmm. the vans. Um, we originally thought we wanted to do that. Because you can park anywhere. Mm -hmm. because it's easy to drive it's just a vehicle um because it's under the limit of national parks um 
anyway, just easy. It just it fits in a regular easy, parking space at the mall. Simple, yeah. Uh, low profile, so like if you're looking to um, boondock or just stay over in parking lots or something, like it's super discreet, I think, because you can just fit in a parking lot. Um, so definitely appealing. Um, do we just want to go into the cons of small? Yeah. So cons of small space. <laughs> yep. Um, cause we need workspace. Um, my biggest con with say a van was the lack of a bathroom. Well, they have wet baths. So what they have is it's like a, basically like a Superman phone booth more or less, um, with a toilet, but the toilet's in there, but the shower is in there too. So you literally shower and go to the bathroom and have a sink and it's all fiberglass so yeah. it's it's a wet bath it all happens in one place and a lot of them have like super fancy convertible things so it can be like a half bath or it can be a shower um but you didn't want that but it is small i didn't want that i also didn't want to have to um we mentioned space because we need workspace i also wanted to have I didn't want my sitting space to have to be turned into my sleeping space. I didn't want to have to convert anything to live in it. Daytime versus nighttime, yeah. like have to change it over every day would be, yeah. would be difficult. It sounds great. Like for a weekend trip, I would totally have a van. It would be super easy, super simple, super fun. Um, and of course, then you wouldn't be working and you would probably not care about flipping things mm -hmm. over because you'd be on the same schedule. But for life, I don't think it makes sense. We always Not said for us. if we had like a condo or something as our permanent address, we would totally have a small class B Sprinter van and just sneak out and go places. But you would have to. But it would still be a small radius, I think. Yeah. We wouldn't want to go across the country weeks. in that. Yeah, you wouldn't, yeah. weeks or months would be difficult mm -hmm. for sure in that. Um, and even so, then it makes you think C, right? Mm -hmm. So then you're like, oh, well, we need a little bit bigger. Let's go C. And again, the van front kind. The appeal of that is that it's easy to drive because it's essentially just a truck, mm -hmm. just a bigger truck. If you've ever driven a U-Haul, it's probably the same thing. Um, they have floor plans to accommodate just about anything you want. Yeah, they're crazy. Um, but they have zero storage. So when they put the box on the frame on a Class C with the van front, it's very low to the ground, which is cool because there's not a lot of steps. Like we have lots of steps coming. We have mm -hmm. six steps coming up into our coach. Cl a lot of the class C's are very low to the ground, but mm -hmm. the problem with that is since they f sit so low, there's no underneath mm -hmm. to put anything in there. So there's no storage. One of the other things with a class C is since it is an Econoline 550 chassis with a Chevy V or the Ford V10, the bigger ones. Um, by the time they put the whole coach, all the stuff on it, it ends up being very close to its max gross vehicle weight rating. So by the time you get your stuff in it, you have to very closely watch your max weight. Otherwise you will be overweight. And it is my personal opinion that to use it for long-term stuff, you will end up being overweight a lot of the time and putting a lot more stress on the chassis because you it it's already so heavy before you even put anything in it. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so, and um, there are only, to my knowledge at this time, we have acorns hitting the roof. Um, uh, to my knowledge at this time, and if you know more than me, and put it in the comments, but I think there's only two or three with a washer and dryer, two or three right. floor plans available in the entire industry in a Class C, that's with the van front, yeah. with with a washer and dryer. And we looked at them and they weren't great floor plans. Um, one of the appeals with a B and a C also, um, because I didn't know what I was getting into, so the... The idea of having not just one door, but to have those driver and passenger doors nice. was appealing. Um, for instance, like getting gas, like we get to the gas pump and he's got to exit 
the passenger side and go all the way around. And of course, we're towing the Jeep. So if he goes the back way to check on everything, he's walking all the way around all of that mm -hmm. to get back to the gas, which is like in the center. Um, so good little hike around to to yeah. just get out of the vehicle to go to the driver's side. Class C's are amazing, though. If you and there are million like hundreds of floor plans mm -hmm. like they're super super cool and if they're great for families a lot of times because they can sleep a lot of people mm -hmm. and they're also um great for like like weekend stuff and camping and and even longer term i mean you could definitely do a lot with them mm -hmm. i just felt like I was going to work the thing too hard. And the biggest thing for us was going to be storage. We, we, we actually picked one out. We, and mm -hmm. actually I came this close to putting a deposit on one in Florida. We almost bought a Jayco Greyhawk 30Z and we, which was a class C motorhome. And we were this close, 32 feet long, but it didn't have laundry and it didn't have enough storage. And we decided to pull the plug on it. Mm -hmm. And then, go ahead. And so the, if we're getting into what we decided on, um, laundry was one of those, I'm not sure, does it matter or not? Um, but then we decided, okay, maybe it would be smart to have the option because we don't know if it's a need or not. So maybe at least having the option would be smart is kind of how we were looking at it. Remember so, that we live full time. Yeah. If you're not full time, laundry is not a th yes. not an issue. Yes. Um, and when there's no COVID. <laughs> yes. So that was another thing. So we did um, end up buying a coach with laundry. It did not come with the washer because it was used. And I don't know, the people took the TVs and the washer. I don't know. But anyway. Robert, I see your comment <clears throat> about fifth wheel versus class A coach and we'll get to oh, that. Oh yeah. We'll good get one. to that because that's part of this. Part of our purchasing process. <laughs> um, but like he said, because of COVID, I just want to mention that before we miss that piece. Um, because of COVID, we actually prioritized it. I have no problem with laundry mats, but I did, I was uncomfortable with the idea of having to sit in a public place with people waiting on laundry. So, um, we decided that that was a bigger priority. We were going to put it in before, cause the idea is maybe we'll keep this for a little bit. You know, you're always thinking about resale value, right? Like when you own an asset, um, thinking about resale and we knew we would have it back to what it should have been. Um, when we go and mm. if we go to sell it. Um, so we knew we would buy a washer and dryer and we just prioritize that so that we wouldn't have to sit in laundry mats yeah. during COVID. Thank goodness, because who knew it would last this long? Exactly. Um, so let's talk about our actual process now. Okay. Cause let's talk about if the fifth wheel was a question. Yeah. So we went through all of that, decided we decided we, we were going to buy more space than we could find in a B or a C. Yep. So then, and we didn't think we were going to go for A, nope. ever. We never even nope. really looked at them. We didn't think about it. Nope. So then we were like, all right, if a C isn't going to work, the thing that has more space is a fifth, is a fifth wheel. wheel. And they're huge inside. Tons of yes. headroom. There's I mean, bedrooms, like they separate. Berserk yeah. floor plans, man. Yeah. Crazy. So cool, though. We, we went, had a lot of fun looking at them. Yeah, and we went to a dealership. We actually got it narrowed down to two brands. Really, really nice ones. One of them was made by Tiffin. So it was like a, an amazing brand mm -hmm. of motorhome. And then the other one was a grand design. It's really, really pretty stuff. A beautiful, like a home inside. What flipped me on it are two things. One is I have a bad back. I, right now I hurt. I hurt 24 seven. I cannot escape the pain that I have every day. Which means on a day like today, when it's raining and there's a hurricane coming and we have to move today, we moved today. I was hurting, but I, so I, but I had to move anyway. I had to do things today. I could not have more to do than absolutely necessary. 
especially when I'm in pain. And now that we have a class A and I watch other people with fifth wheels. <laughs> we made the right decision. Yes. We watch other people with fifth wheels. And this was also advice from a buddy of mine who's had them. He's like, you're going to bring a bunch of wood blocks with you. You're going to, there's the setup and the hookup and the everything is going to be a big pain. And then the other thing that flipped us away from having a fifth wheel is for those of you that know me at all from either channel, you know that I love to drive and that I'm an absolute gearhead and that I have to have something that I enjoy driving. We went to a Dodge dealer. We test drove a new Dodge diesel. I was going to buy it. But when we test drove it, I was like, I can't see sightseeing in this. I can't see driving through these little seaside towns in this big diesel. Grocery shopping. Grocery shopping, running errands. Yeah. I can't see living with this humongous truck that I have to drive everywhere all the time. All the time. It was at a Jeep dealer because it's a Dodge dealer. And our Jeep Rubicon that we do we own now was there and we walked past it and I was like immediately both of us yeah. were like mind is changed we are buying a class A and we're buying a Jeep and yeah. we're towing a because Jeep. when it comes down to it so what the appeal of a fifth wheel is and if you own a truck already that can pull a fifth wheel that's great maybe you don't have a bad back and you already have a great truck yep. buying a fifth wheel makes sense because the price point is amazing but basically, you're deciding where do you put the money. Right. The money goes where the engine is. So do you buy a truck or do you buy a motorhome um, is essentially where that decision had to be. Right. So for us, and I'll give you real numbers. So for us, it's either buy, it's either spend sixty to $70,000 on a truck that can pull a fifth wheel and then spend forty to $50,000 on a fifth wheel. Mm-hmm. Or spend on a used motorhome, sixty to seventy thousand dollars on a used motorhome, and then have control over how much you spent on the vehicle that you towed. Mm -hmm. So for us, that net, I didn't care about the total amount of money really. At that point, I cared more about the functionality of it. But what it ended up being was the net amount of money that we spent for both units ended up being less than if we were to go buy a Dodge diesel and a 37 foot fifth wheel to pull behind it. Mm -hmm. It ended up being less money doing this. And I, again, I didn't really care about that at the time, but now that it's all done, I'm grateful that we made right. the decision for the money side too. I was more concerned about the practicality of it. We can be, and here's the thing about this, with the fifth, and we'll get back to the size of the motorhome in just a second. Yeah. But the practicality of the fifth wheel versus the motorhome is this. Because I watch it every day when we pull into park, RV parks. Mm -hmm. We are totally set up right now, living, doing a live stream with you. It is 10 o'clock. If we wanted to be rolling out of here in 30 minutes with the Jeep hooked up, ready to go down the road, we could totally do it and not even hurry. The people that have fifth wheels, they're 45 minutes to an hour and they are underneath stacking up blocks, messing with tons of stuff. And I just didn't want to deal with all that. Yeah, and I didn't realize what a, even for the nice ones, it is a very manual process. And some, you have to get really expensive packages to have automatic Auto stuff, and all that stuff on fifth wheels. So when they're telling you this and they're just like, oh, it has jacks, but all that's manual. And they're literally under there and they make horrible noise i don't know if nobody ever greases anything like <laughs> there are some horrid sounds that come out of yes parks yes so back to the size of an actual motorhome yeah. because we did not want no nope. we had in our heads we didn't want anything bigger than 34 feet yeah we wanted small yeah because we thought it would be easier to drive and just more practical and based on the floor plans we could get what we wanted in that size 
Um, we had to really look for it. So some of the key things for us, for me, I don't know. Go ahead. Um, no, yeah, I it's... wanted separate sitting spaces, if you will. So I wanted a couch and some kind of dinette or table because if you're going to be in here all the time, sometimes you just need your own space to be. And we mm -hmm. needed workspace and we needed like living space. Um, so that was something that was important to me. Um, storage underneath, it had plenty of storage. Um, I wanted a pantry of all random things. But, you know, you go in some of these and you're like, oh, there's plenty of place for my dishes. And then you're like, wait, where do you put the food? Um, so at 34 feet, we're yeah. 38. So at 34 feet, some things that are impossible, or not impossible, but very uncommon, at 34 feet are... Washer and dryer is almost yep. totally you can't get one. Uh, 34 feet, you will not get two bathrooms. Yep. 34 feet, uh, you might get a pantry, but you will give up something else. Yep. Um, those are probably the big ones. 34 feet, queen bed instead of king probably a lot of times. Yeah. Some of them, um, less counter space in yep. the kitchen. Yep. And also, we have 197 cubic feet of storage underneath. 34 footer will give you probably 105 to 120. In a cubic. good one. In a good one. Because we looked, literally, we were looking at like, that's how we picked out the class C we had picked out is based on basement storage. Because I think it went from like 53 and yep. that one had 100 somehow. And now we have but 200. Then, but then we decided... The reason is because it had none inside. So it's like they put it all in the box. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It was just all these mm -hmm. gives and takes and you felt like you were always going to have to compromise. I will tell you the number one selling point that people try to tell you why you should have a class A is for the windshield. And we were like, that is just a big piece of glass. That sounds overrated. I don't want to, to do all my exploring looking out a window. Like that doesn't make sense. Um, the floor is level, so like the seats, like it's all its own space, and they advertise down. like flipping the chairs around and all this stuff. But what it did do for us, one, the windshield is probably better than we thought it was going to be because you can't awesome. see a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, two, we don't use the chairs to pull it as a part of a living room setting, but what it did give us that we didn't even see coming is Dylan's office space. Mm -hmm. um, so he has a full computer set up. Um, in the passenger seat when we are parked. That has been great. Um, benefit we didn't see happening. It almost seems like a luxury when we got this one was two bathrooms. Love but two bathrooms. what that does is gives us double tank storage. Yes. Which is perfect because then we don't have to worry about having some little portable thing that people have or having to dump more often and gives us more flexibility to not need full hookup. We don't have full hookups where we're at now. Right. Um, so it just gives us more flexibility. We're at an Army Corps of Engineers park for mm -hmm. two weeks. So all we have is water and electric. Um, if we were to have a 34-foot coach with one bathroom, we would probably have to go dump our tanks every f five days. We can probably go 10 with this as mm -hmm. long as we don't do laundry we can't do laundry when we don't have and we full usually hookups. don't when we don't have full hookups because we don't know exactly how much water usage it takes so we don't question yeah. or take that chance um because doing dishes is more important than laundry yeah. um one thing you thought you were gonna hate and we ended up loving is a residential refrigerator. I love it. Yeah. I thought I wanted a propane one, but now I don't. Yeah. I want, I always want a residential refrigerator. It runs off an inverter, bank of batteries, generator, electric. It's amazing. Ice in the door, water, just like at your house. And I didn't realize ice was such a commodity. Like people are like, I have to buy this countertop. And I'm like, oh, I'm sure glad I have an ice maker. maker. <laughs> so let's talk about considerations. So now we have a 38 foot motorhome. Yep. We have two bathrooms. We have all the things we want. We have things we didn't even know we wanted, but now we have them. It's amazing. But let's talk about considerations when you go big 
Mm-hmm. What things do we have to deal with and think about and think ahead um, that a smaller coach may not have to? Um, so let's... one thing, let's talk about the difference in ours, because even motorhomes of this size can be a different weight class, right? And Correct. we are a heavy weight class. Right. So um, there are two different types of chassis. There are two different sizes of Ford chassis um, for these big motorhomes. So we have, the, there's the smaller one, and here's how you can tell. Um, the smaller one has 19 and a half inch wheels. That one, I believe, I could be wrong on this, but I believe the gross vehicle weight rating on that chassis with the 19 and a half inch wheels is 19,500 pounds or like right around 20,000 pounds. Don't quote me on that. Look it up if you're interested. It's right around 20,000 pounds. We have 21 and a half inch like Alcoa aluminum rims. And that's how you can tell just by looking at it that it is a 24,000 pound gross vehicle weight rating chassis. They have the same transmission. They have the same, they have different axles and stuff, but they have the same transmission, same engine, but it can take a lot more weight. That being said, we are 23,000 pounds fully loaded. So, you know, living in it. So we are heavy but it can take it and it drives. So let's talk about driving it. Um, when we're talking about consideration of a huge motorhome, people get really scared about it. It drives so good. It honestly, the bigger it is with the big chassis, it, it drives so good. And there's a video coming out on Thursday. We went to safety plus in Tullapoosa, Georgia, and I put it safety plus, um, steering stabilizer on it and that like brought it up another million percent it drives so good people th ask me all the time what's that thing like to drive like is it crazy is it scary i've driven big stuff before but obviously this is a different thing um we're 60 feet long when we're towing the jeep we have three and a half feet of tail swing because we have uh, 14 feet of rear overhang from the center of the rear axle to the back of the motorhome is 14 feet. So that means that you, here's how you figure this out on any vehicle. Here's a little tip on any vehicle from the center of the rear axle to the extremity of the end of it. So on a pickup truck, on a car, on anything from the center of the rear axle to the very back tip, divide that by four. And that is how much your tail will swing out when you go around a corner. So we have 14 feet. So we have approximately three feet, eight inches of tail swing that I got to worry about when I pull into gas pumps. Yeah. So what that means is you could be making a right turn and you're looking, you're checking your right side and try not to hit a curb or hit the ditch. But you have to worry about that left side because it might swing into the other lane where there's traffic. So yes. Um, it is not like driving a regular vehicle. Um, we did, I've not driven big things before. So I wanted to sign up for a driving class. He did mm -hmm. it with me um, just so we would get the same information and we could talk about it and understand. I don't drive it often. I could if I had to, but what it does help me do is if we're ever in a situation where we're working together to fit it in a spot. I mean, we've been in a state park where we're like wiggling Trees around. Everywhere. Um, I know what it can do. I know how he drives. I know what the limitations are and we can get it in a spot. So if you are going to be the principal driver and your spouse um, or significant other is probably never, ever going to drive it, I encourage you to both educate yourselves mm -hmm. on all these things on how to drive it maybe take a driving course together to drive big things um, most motorhome dealerships will do this uh, good ones most good motorhome dealerships can will will help you with this and even if your significant other is not going to drive it on a regular basis like she said it is really good because since she understands the physics of it after learning all of it 
she really helps me as a co-pilot when we're backing into places not even just backing into places but you know um changing lanes you know in a lot of where there's lots of traffic so she can help me perceive things that i might not be able to see because she also grasps the size of the thing and understands how to drive it even if she doesn't drive it all the time so i would definitely recommend that you do that um the other thing obviously stopping distance obviously you know all those things driving it is there's things you have to think about and the longer it is um uh, I had a guy ask me this the other day, actually, um, when we I met him at Safety Plus, and he asked me about gas pumps. Mm. So fueling is one of the most annoying things because you don't fit in a regular gas station. So she's very good at this. She's way better at it than me. What we do is if we know we're leaving tomorrow, we will plan. I uh, look at how much we have left on the tank. I never run it below 100 miles. I keep that as my safety buffer, like 100 miles to zero. And then uh, we will figure out how long we have to get to the next gas station. And then we'll Google map a pilot or a TA or a, you know, loves or something big. Um, and then actually Google map it, like satellite map it and plan our entry and what pump we're going to go for. We like really plan this because we have been in situate well one time where we went the wrong way around a building and ended up a spot where we couldn't be and if you're towing a vehicle you can't back it up so you have to unhook the Jeep and wiggle all around and get out of there. So we don't want to get in a situation where we do that. So we really plan all of our fuel stops. So the bigger you get, the more you have to do that. You really have to plan that stuff mm -hmm. to get it right. Um, and so that would be the appeal of a diesel. Yes. Because then you just have fuel lanes that you know you fit in every time. Yep. Um, I never thought of that before. It is definitely on my mind for any future purposes. Um, let's also talk about, you touched on, before we get back um before we miss this piece though you mentioned that you don't let the tank get below 100 miles to zero um and i just want to mention that's not for the fuel economy even of the coach but you don't know what kind of situation you're going to end up being in our coach uses the same fuel for the generator so if we needed to run the generator we want to make sure we have enough fuel so that you have that backup system available excellent example um hurricane Zeta hit Alabama a couple of weeks ago. We were without power for almost a full day, but I didn't worry about it because I had enough gas. In the I was actually kind of worried about it because we were kind of <laughs> close to a quarter tank. What it is is it takes it off the main gas tank, runs you down to a quarter of a tank, and then shuts off the generator. You can't run the generator after your fuel tank yeah. is below a quarter. So your generator is not going to lose all your gas. Yeah, yeah. you don't want to run your coach out of gas. So... Um, but we were able to do that. We were able to run our generator the entire time and had power and stuff until the power came back on. So, you know, planning and also just having a fuel range. There's a couple questions I want to catch up on. Um, one is, do you go to the kids or can they come to you? Most of the time, we go to the kids because they are grown and, and have work and they have constantly. job. Yeah, our daughter works two jobs. Um, our son goes to school six, and, and works, works six days a week and works six days a week. So they're, they're, they're at the point in their lives where they want to be grown. And they, I think, and I think they, yeah. they love their own independence yeah, they and like their own that. vehicles. Yeah. They have their own trucks. <laughs> you remember being a young you know, person, they, right? They have their own trucks and they, they, I mean, Bryson won't let you yeah. buy a toothbrush. He like really likes having that. And so they, they work and you know so they're doing their own thing so we we go visit them yeah and i um, think the appeal in in my fantasy head like i thought oh we'll be a cool place and they'll come but they're so busy and they don't like to take off work so yeah. i mean i can't argue with that either i remember being like that jason albert asks um what type of classification do you have to have on your driver's license for the different classes of motorhomes so um I don't have to have any classification. This is the scariest part. 
any moron can drive one of these things. Yes. It is. Which is why there is like a, a, a truck community that probably, but we've seen some real idiot RVers too Oof. and very inconsiderate. So I could understand why the truck drivers, you know, they have a if job to do. If you get one of these things, yeah. try to be as courteous yeah. and as aware, self-aware as you can. Yeah. As Defensive you learn, driving will come into yes. play because everybody wants to pull out in front of you. Yes. Just just really be be a good and I don't mean be a good driver like the skills. The skills will come mm -hmm. as you drive it more. I mean be a good person. <laughs> like because like just be nice and be a good person as best you can as you learn because Man, there are some even as a regular morons. driver, be a nice person. Now that's the other thing, and be aware that they don't have to have a special permit. Yeah. So don't assume somebody knows how to drive either when you see a big yes. motorhome on the road. In your regular car, <laughs> yeah. Be a nice person to people that drive big things, <laughs> because you have no idea how long that person has not been driving it. Right. Um, I feel fairly confident and pretty experienced i mean I'll, i can put this thing anywhere i don't really care about it but i talk to drivers almost every time i i mean if a motorhome pulls up next to you at loves it's always a guy especially in florida like when we're in florida every time i stop and get gas somebody will be like yeah man i just got this i've only driven it 12 miles and i'm like i'll let you leave first like just <laughs> yeah um, as far as the driver's license classification, there are a couple of states now uh, that once you get over 26,000, oh, yeah. um, you do have to have, South Carolina is one actually, Okay. Um, that I, I've heard noise. I don't, I have not confirmed it. I should do a video about it and do the research about it and put it all together. But... Um, South Carolina, I'm pretty sure if the if the GVWR is over 26,001 pounds, that you have to have a particular class of regular driver's license. It's not, so it's not commercial. Yeah, you don't have to get but, a commercial one. Okay. You don't have to get a CDL. But there is, you know, like mine's a class D with a motorcycle endorsement. There's some other class that you have to get. I think it's because they just want to know that you have it. And also, um, these things, you know, most states tax the vehicles and your licenses and everything by weight. So the amount of weight that the thing is, is going to affect how much your license costs. And, mm. you know, because it's wear on the roads and all that. So um, there is that. Okay, so let's talk about where we put this thing. So everybody wants to know about natural national parks. They want to know about, does your motorhome fit? where you you know we were worried about that too going this big and then not having places available it has almost never ever been an issue correct ever the one thing i will say is many rv parks use 60 or 70 feet as their big long pull through sites so like right now i'm in a back end site so i have to unhook the jeep and we back it into the spot um a lot of KOAs, a lot of bigger market campgrounds will have pull-through spots where, especially if you're only staying for the night, you don't even unhook your tow vehicle. You just like pull in and you just plug in and you sleep and then you unplug and you leave in the morning and you don't have to back up. You just like pull straight through. Some of those sites are 60 feet long and we have had situations where we were told it was a pull-through site and it was like, 57 feet long and i really had to squish that thing in there um, yeah we've unhooked in some pull through sites before because being the nice people that we are because we're trying to fit on these lanes they usually have very small narrow drives in campgrounds mm -hmm. um and if a vehicle is sticking out, that is very problematic for bigger mm -hmm. vehicles to get through. So we don't want to be that person to anybody else, nor do we want anybody to hit our Jeep. So right. um, we do try to be mindful of that. So being 59 feet long, um, there. so for the people that want something longer, if we had 
the 42 foot diesel, we have been in spaces that we would not have been in. Yeah. There are places they do like a designation and they call them big rigs. And I think that means like 70 plus length sites. Right. But even like this one. So we're in a site today. Um, this is considered a 45 foot site. Really? It's huge. It's huge. Yeah. We could have fit anything in this site. Mm -hmm. And you, we could have backed anything in. It was yeah. easy to back it in. Um, yeah. So that's, that's definitely a thing. Um, they're all the same width, basically. They're 105 inch wide. Um, so fitting it in lanes and stuff. I will say, um, you do have to do some trip planning. We need to do a video about our trip planning software um, that we use to make sure that we fit on the roads. So like there are some two lane roads and narrow bridges and stuff. And um, low bridges. Well, I'm talking about the oh. width oh. where I have been on roads literally where my tires are on the lines. Like I barely fit on the road going 55. I mean, it's there. Some of them are kind of small. So you have to plan for that. And then the other thing you have to plan for is like she said is bridges. We're 12 foot, eight inches tall. Well, that's what we're 12 foot six, but I go eight. So we're 12 foot, eight inches tall. Um, and so you have to plan for that. You also have to plan for um, weight. So especially in some like we were in Kansas and there were some of these like farm roads and stuff. And they're like max weight, 10 tons. And you're like, well, <laughs> I guess we can't go down there because the roads, you know, because you'll break a culvert or something or a bridge, you know, you don't want to do that. So you have to know what your weight is. You have to know what your height is and you have to know what your length is. Yep. Um, definitely. And so, and that's something I learned, like, you know, you, we've been traveling and doing trips a lot and you don't think anything about just following the directions, whatever Google tells you. We've had some fun in the Jeep with whatever Google told us mm -hmm. and ended up on dirt roads and crazy roads and it's fine but you can't do that when you're this big you have to pre-plan mm -hmm. you have to know where you're going um google is notorious for like oh i found a faster route let me change your directions um there's no way to like lock it in google if you're watching that would be a great feature enhancement once i tell you where i want to go i want to go that way um anyway yes. um so we use some other apps to kind of to figure all that out I do think one thing you should talk about, we talked about the motorhome and the tail swing and learning how to drive the motorhome. Um, people are super intimidated by the towing part, but in our case, towing has been beneficial. Can we talk about that? Yeah, so um, a lot of people want to know, I, th I think I saw somebody even at the very beginning of the video say, Scott said, Dylan, you must be a tremendous driver. I would have probably totaled the Jeep by now, uh, having it behind the motorhome. Um, you would be surprised how easy it is to tow uh, a vehicle. It, you, I don't feel it hard at all, ever, really. Um, like to the point we have a camera on so that we know the Jeep is still back there. Yes. I think a refrigerator magnet just fell off. Was it a magnet or is that ice again? Oh, it might be ice. Our ice maker, uh, like... Jammed up on me jammed today up. So and it's just been, threw ice all over it's the floor. Been dropping it was really nice. Ice today. <laughs> um, what did you just ask me? Jeep. Tona Jeep. So, um, yeah, we have a camera on it because I literally cannot feel it. I mean, I, I look over there and see that it's still there and that everything is fine because I cannot feel it. Um, you don't have to be afraid about towing it in 99% of situations because it's narrower than you. So if you do not hit a curb with your motorhome, um, you will not hit the curb with the Jeep. Yeah, it Be just tracks. It just tracks you. behind you. And um, the only time that that does not follow is when you're weaving your way through something very, very tight because remember the tail swing of the thing, it follows the tail. It doesn't follow the motorhome, it follows the tail. So when you turn a really sharp corner, the tail goes that way. 
So the Jeep actually goes that way first, then it goes that way. So um, there have been a couple of times really tight parks where I've had to really watch the Jeep and make sure that I didn't hit something with it. Maybe twice. That Salt Lake City, that one time was really tight. Um, we, there's been a couple times where it's been really, really tight and I've had to watch it. 99% of the time, it's just back there and you don't even know it's there. It's like not even a stress at all to the point that you forget it's there. Um, and it, yeah, and it's so fine. like the wind. So, and the other thing is that being 38 feet long, being 12 and a half feet tall, you are the biggest billboard of a sail of a thing when it's windy. And having 14 feet of rear overhang, if a gust of wind or a truck hits you, with the Safety Plus actually now, it's 99% better. But when the tail, when wind hits the tail, it, it wags the whole thing. With the Jeep on there, towing a Jeep with having 4,600 pounds of Jeep behind you, it settles the chassis down a lot. So, um, in my opinion, I, I feel safer, the thing feels more stable when I am towing than when I am not. Mm -hmm. Because the, it, it really calms down the chassis a lot, big time. Um, do you have to make reservations at places? Yes. Yes and no. We have flown by the seat of our pants sometimes, but with COVID, we've had to make more reservations. It's harder. As it relates to size, anything over about 34 feet, you probably have to give it way more consideration Anything small, 24 feet, 30 feet, 32 feet, most places will have, that'll be no big deal at all. You'll be able to get a reservation. As long as there is a spot, you will fit in it. Um, there are a lot of times where there might be 10 spots that'll fit a 35 foot unit and there'll be two spots that fit us. So you do have to kind of watch that a little bit more. Um, yeah, so to elaborate on that, COVID, we thought we were going to be a little more free with our planning. That way, if we got to a place and we really liked it, we could stay, we could go. Um, COVID kind of affected that in the sense that there were a lot of people out this summer. Mm -hmm. We had to plan a little bit more. Um, and there, there was a little piece of time where it was, it was a little more difficult to book and we have had to call multiple places sometimes mm -hmm. to, to follow the path that we wanted to go. Um, but we've never had changed our plans. We've been able to do everything we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Um, but also we are trying to be mindful. We are working and we need internet. So it's easy to get reservations just anywhere. Yep. It's not easy to make sure you're in a place where you're going to have internet coverage and that you're not far from town because we're delivering packages, you know, like sending things in the mail. And I'm going to send you your pickups when I build them. Like we have to work. Yeah. So um, we are not the appeal that people have of like going off grid and being in the middle of nowhere. We'd love to be able to do that. We are so not there. We are working. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um, we do try to make those smart decisions to make sure. And we still don't get it right. And we're realizing things aren't as consistent. We've stayed in this park before. And the coverage was great. And I feel like it, it could be the weather. The weather is really crappy it's today. It's not terrible. It's not terrible. But um, we're it's still not what I expected. This. Yeah. So we're just trying to be smart. Um, Charles Wallace, or let's see, Dennis asks, uh, if this is a core site. Yeah, this is an Army Corps of Engineers park that we're in on a lake in Georgia. Yep. 
Um, so here's another little tip for you, and you anybody can download this. You can go do it on your phone right now. Um, there is an app called Open Signal, and it basically it's user driven. So if I open the app right now, it reports to the tower what my signal is. So then the next person that opens the app sees how good the signal is here. That's basically how it works. You zoom out and you have a map of the United States and it breaks it down by carrier. So AT&T, T-Mobile and Verizon. And you can see how good the signal is in a place that you are projecting to go. So if we're going to be in this area before we even make the reservation or when we're planning our trip and making the reservation, we open up the app and we'd be like, well, there's no signal there. We can't be there because we have to work. I have to make videos and she has to work on the internet. So we won't even stay there. We'll find somewhere with some signal and then we will make a reservation there. It's an awesome app. Um, in our trip planning video, we will talk about it and I'll show a screenshot of it and stuff. Cause it's pretty cool. It's not, it's not like a religion you can live by to the, to the nth degree, but it does at least get you closer. Um, and of course we have all the tools, the cell phone boosters and all that junk. So if it's decent, we can make it good. And if it's good, we can make it really great. So. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. So, Charles, to your point about the notification, that was not an error. No. Unless it was just a Dylan error because for some reason his com – oh, it does say the right it time did it now. now. It did it now. Anyway, his computer is between the time change and then the time change. So, like, we changed time zones and then the time change happened. Um, his computer kind of, like, freaked out about that. And this is the second time we've had a little hiccup with scheduling time. So, we just – Went live because it is it is 9.30 Eastern, Eastern time on, on Sunday nights. Um, but we didn't realize until we were about to go live that the notification was incorrect. Yep. So sorry about that, Charles. Glad you got to pop on. Yep. Thanks, everybody. This has been super fun. This has been a good one. There's been, good, been some good questions. And I, I hope... Saw, um, did, you, did we miss some? Um, I saw some questions above about um, back to the removing logos. Somebody said, can you use fish in line? But I think to to your point, you mentioned that it needs that wax. Like there's a film, right? You could like, use fishing line. I've used fishing okay. line before. And then somebody asked, would that also work on laptop stickers? I would probably... Is it different? No. I mean, if you have a bumper sticker on your laptop, it might work. A but puffy sticker, it'll work. You know, like, you know what yeah. I mean? Those like, oh. puffier stickers, it would work. But no, it wouldn't really work for that. Nope. Cool. This yeah, has been I think we super caught most of them. Awesome. Though. I hope that helped clarify some of the. Um, size is a thing. I mean, man. what would we do next? I don't want to be bigger. I will say that. Mm. No, I don't want to be bigger um, because finding spots. For instance, we do like core parks. Um, most of them have a max of forty feet. Um, I would never want to be bigger than 40. Yeah, but I wouldn't want to. I mean, I always look for 40, even though we're 38. Like, that's pushing it to me. Yeah. Because then you have no wiggle room, well, ideally. But this I is know 45, I and there's, yeah. So, this is a gas coach. To go diesel, you would end up with a motor in the back with way more storage because there's no drive shaft coming up through the middle to break it up. Um, air brakes, the whole deal, which it would be amazing. But what I think I really want is I want a Super C, which is a Class C, so it has a truck front end, like a van front end, but it's not a van. It's like a semi 